but thank you so much for being here today. My name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here, and I just want to welcome all of you here. If you're a regular, if you're a guest with us, and also those of you who uh, tune in by YouTube, want to say welcome to you as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. We just believe that God has a special word for you today. And I've been praying for you today uh, and this week as I've been preparing this message that God would really speak to us in a special way today. I know many of you are fasting. If, you're not, if you haven't chosen to join us in that fast, like Pastor Rory said, join us, join us now. And even if you're not fasting something, we hope you join us in praying. We want to pray for one another. We want to pray for our church. We want to pray for each other uh, personally. Uh, one of the prayers that I've been praying, that Ashley and I have been praying together, actually, is a prayer for personal revival. Have you ever needed personal revival in your life? Like you just feel like things are kind of humdrum and, and you just feel like you, you maybe do some things out of duty or obligation rather than because you want to, right? And you just need those times of refreshing. You need those times of renewal. And that's, a, that's one of the prayers that Ashley and I have been praying. Not that we're all burnt out or anything, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is we want to we exude, we want to grow and increase in our passion for God. We want to grow in our love for him. We want to grow when the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. But when he says that, that's where we want to live. That's where we want to be. We want to love him like that. We want to love him in that kind of capacity, in that kind of fullness. So that's been our prayer as we've been fasting together. Uh, Lord, help us. How many of you know fasting is difficult? I, I heard somebody tell, told me, uh, uh, they said, I don't want to brag or anything, but I finished my 21-day fast in 48 hours. Okay. <laughs> now, if that's you, if that's you, I just want you to encourage, you, you can pick it back up. Pick it back up. If you, if you messed up, pick it back up and keep on going, okay? Uh, but our prayer as we've entered into this new year and as we've entered into our fifth year as a church body, uh, we, we simply just want to go even more all in with God. We want to be even more surrendered to his lordship. We want to be more fully yielded to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and we want to make it a, a practice of, of our lives to always seek God first, to put him first in everything. We don't want prayer to be a last resort. Amen? We want prayer to be our first response in everything we do. We want to pray first. So that sounds really spiritual, right? But the truth is, if I'm being really honest with you, Ashley and I, uh, we will admit to you right up front, we mess up all the time. Boy, we fall short all the time. We don't have it all together. Uh, we fail almost every day. But thank God, somebody say amen, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And his love extends to us. And though we fail and though we fall short, we ask God to help us. We ask God to forgive us and to help us to keep moving forward in our relationship with him. The bottom line and the heart of the matter is I'm, I'm hungry for more of God in my life. I'm hungry to have more of him. I'm hungry for him to have more of me. Hello, I'm hungry for him to have more control and, and lordship over me. I'm hungry for personal revival. And I want to see that in my life, in my marriage, in my family. I want to see it in all of us, too. I want to see it in our city. I want to see it in our nation. Come on, somebody. Say, I'm going to pray for the United States of America. How many of you know our, our, church, our, our government leaders need our prayers more than ever right now? We're going to pray for revival and that the word of God will be made known to them and they will have wisdom in their decisions. So we're praying in, in, the, in, those, in, those, in that light. And so today we're in day seven in our 21 days of prayer and fasting. I just want to encourage you guys, keep on keeping on. Keep praying. Expect results. Expect God. This is the confidence that we have when we pray to our God. He hears us. And if he hears us, we can have faith that he will respond and that he will answer us in his time. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Who diligently seek him. I 
want to encourage you. Keep diligently seeking him this, this uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting and every day um, for, that, for that matter. So why do we fast and pray? Why do we fast and pray? Because we want to seek God first, right? We want to seek him first. We want to pray first. As the new year begins, we want to pray. As the week begins, we want to put him first. As our day begins, we want to put him first. And so this is why we pray. And we pray and fast also because our bridegroom king, King Jesus, has been taken away for, for, from us for a time. Temporarily, He even said in the scripture in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, Jesus uh, said himself, But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. He's talking about his believer, his, his, his followers, his disciples. He's talking about them back then, but he's also talking about us who follow after Jesus Christ. It's a time to fast. Because our bridegroom has been taken away temporarily. But how many of you know that our bridegroom king is going to return? He is coming back one day very soon. Our bridegroom king is going to come back and receive his bride back to, unto himself. You see, Jesus is our bridegroom king. This is what the Bible teaches. And we are his beloved bride. Yes, Jesus has been taken away from his disciples for a time. But one day very soon, our risen King Jesus will be returning for his pure and spotless bride. And I desire, and I know you do too, I desire to be ready. I desire to be prepared. I desire to be close to him. I desire to be living according to the truth of his word. I desire to be found working in his harvest fields when he comes. I want to share with you a quote from Arthur Wallace in a book called God's Chosen Fast. I want you to look at this. It's up on the screen with me. Look at this. Fasting opens the way for the outpouring of the Spirit and the restoration of God's house. Fasting in this age of the absent bridegroom is in expectation of his return. Amen? Soon, there will be the midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. It will be too late then to fast and pray. The time is now. The time is now to seek God first. The time is now to repent of our sins and to fast and to pray and call out to him. And so as I've been sharing with you, as I shared with you last week, I believe the the agenda of the Holy Spirit, the the Holy Spirit is restoring what what we commonly call the great commandment. The Bible describes the great commandment as the first, the greatest, the most important commandment that God ever, that God gave. And I believe the Holy Spirit is restoring that great commandment to first place in the body of Christ. And so that the church begins to love the Lord thy God with all of our heart again. The church begins to focus and pay attention to to not just ministry to one another, not just preaching from a pulpit, but ministry unto the Lord. Ministry unto Him. Praying to Him. Worshiping Him. Praising Him where our focus is upon Him. And loving Him with all of our hearts and souls and minds and strength. I believe that is the passion of the Holy Spirit. That's the agenda of the Holy Spirit in this time right now. Restoring the love of God. The love for God. In the body of Christ. And so today I want us to go again to Mark chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. If you have your worship guides, there's uh, message notes in there that you can follow along. But in Mark chapter 12, we're going to see a religious man who's, number one, trying to entrap Jesus, get him in trouble, and trap him with his own words. And and number two, we're going to see this guy, uh, he's going to learn what is that first, and what is that greatest, and what is that most important commandment of God. Let's look at it together. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28. It says this, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, 
Look at this question, guys. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Of all the commandments of God in the, in the Old Testament, all the commandments of God in there, in there, which one is the most important? Which one is the greatest? Which one is the one that is, uh, th- should be first? And, it go- and the Bible goes on to say, uh, Jesus answered and he said, the most important one is this. And he gives a quote from Deuteronomy. He says, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. I want us to see that together with fresh eyes, maybe, for the, for the, for the first time in a long time. Maybe the Holy Spirit would make those words jump off the page or jump off the screen into your heart. And I want you to see this as the priority of God, to love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God with everything that is within you. In other words, as we enter 2019, the first, the most important, the greatest thing we can do in in this year and in our entire lives is to love the Lord our God. And I told you last week, some of the most powerful things in Scripture are also some of the most simple. This is simple, yet powerfully profound when we really grasp it and we really understand what it means. We are to love Him ahead of everything else in our lives. That's what we're called to do. That's what this commandment tells us to do. We're to love Him fervently, diligently passionately with every part of our being we're to love him emotionally intellectually volitionally physically with everything that we have but the question that I wrestle with this week and I want us to think about today a little bit is this how do you love God like that how do you love him like that how can we sometimes crazy human beings In all of our weaknesses, in all of our shortcomings, in all of our sins, how can we really love God like that? And is it even possible? I believe it is possible. I believe it's very, very possible. And here's here's how you begin. Jot this down if you're taking it. You begin by seeking to comprehend how much God really loves you. You experience the love of God for yourself. First, let me, say it, let me say it this way. This is up on the screen. The more you understand and experience God's love for you, the more you will be able to love him in return. I want you to, I want you to think about that today because grasping the love of God can be pretty difficult, right? Growing up, I knew, I knew that there was a God. I knew that God loved me, but I also loved other things like candy, pizza, my girlfriend. Uh, I also loved uh, video games and all kinds of stuff. But I knew God's love meant something different. It meant something more. It meant something greater. And so I begin to think about God's love. I just want you to take a break for a moment. Like really think about the love of God for you in this moment. Consider this. He, he created you. He formed you in his image out of love he sustains your life you wouldn't even be able to do the next minute if it were not for God sustaining your life he heals us where we're broken and wounded he he delivers us where we feel trapped and troubled he he forgives us and he redeems our lives from the pit and he calls us his own he, his, the love of God is what sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And, and he provided salvation for everyone who believes in Jesus. It's God's, God revealed his love when he filled us with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. God revealed his love through the gifts And the talents and the abilities and the resources that he has given to us. He reveals his love by by making us a part of his family. We were once cut off from him. We were once 
orphan. Like he brought us into his family and called us his sons and his daughters. This is the love of God. This is the love of our God. And because of his great love for us, and for, for me personally, this is how I need to understand it. Because of his love, and because this love has been shed abroad, the Bible says, or dispersed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Because of that, now I can love God with everything that I am. Because he loved me first, I can now love him with everything that I am. He empowers me. He, the love of God, it takes God. Let me tell you this. It takes God to love God. It took all of his love that was poured out for us. And it took his Holy Spirit to shed that love abroad in our hearts. And so we think about the great commandment. And we think about how we can personally experience the love of God in Christ Jesus. And now we can love him. This is in your notes. If you're, jot, if you're taking notes with me, jot this down. We can love him with all of our heart and soul. Right? What is that? That is our affection. That is the seed of our affection. That is who we are on the inside. It's our feelings. It's our passion. And we learn about this by asking the question, what do I love the most? It's an introspective question. It's a question to ask of yourself. What do I love the most? Because of the love of God, we can also love him with all of our mind. In other words, we can focus our full attention upon God. And the question we need to ask ourselves in this, in this time is, what do I think about the most? What's on my mind the most? What what's occupies my, my mental capacities the most? And because of the love of God, not only can we love him with all of our heart and soul, with our mind, but we can also love him fully and completely with all of our strength. With all of our strength, this is where we, where we, this is our abilities and our gifts and our resources. All of those things has to do with our strength. What are we doing with our hands? What are we doing with our feet? What are we working on for Him? And the question is, what do I do the most? <clears throat> so, friends, if we love God like this, then He is our first love. He is our first love. Have you experienced Jesus Christ as your first love? Are you experiencing him now as your first love? What, is, what does that mean? The first love means that it comes before all others. It comes before all others. It is the greatest love. It is the highest love priority in your life. It is the most important love relationship in your life. It is this love for our Lord and Savior, our bridegroom king, Jesus Christ. It's a love that is far that is that should be greater than our love for ourselves. Should be greater than our love for our family. Should be greater th than our love for our friends. It should be greater than a love for our stuff. For the things that we have in this life. I was reading a quote this, this uh, week by A.W. Tozer, and um, he's a man of God, preacher of the word, pastor. And he said, he said a prayer that I want to share with you. It's up on the screen. It says this, Father, I want to know thee, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. And I do not try to hide them from thee, the terror of that parting. I come trembling, but I do come. And then he says this, listen to this. Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a, a very part of my living self. So that, listen to this part. So that thou mayest enter and dwell there without a rival. So that our Lord and Jesus may enter our lives, may enter every part of our hearts and dwell there without a rival. 
This is loving God with all of your heart and soul. This is loving God with all of your mind. This is loving God with all of your strength. And when we have this first love, when this first love is living and active in our lives, then we do everything because of our love for him. We don't do things out of obligation or a sense of duty, and neither do we do things to bring honor for ourselves. We do it for one reason alone, and that is because of of our love for Jesus. This is the heartbeat. This is the motivation. Now, let me ask you a question, and and I'm sure that this question does not apply to anyone in the room. Okay, It may apply to all the people who miss church today, or it may apply to everybody watching this on YouTube, but it doesn't apply to us. I'm sure of that. Okay, But here's the question. What if you're a Christian and maybe you've grown a little bit lukewarm? Maybe you've, you've, you've slacked off, you've drifted away somehow from your passion in your relationship with God. Maybe you've, maybe you've come to the place where you would just admit, man, I used to love God like that, but not anymore. For whatever reason, I used to be fully devoted. I used to be obedient. I used to be all in. I used to obey Him wholeheartedly. I used to be zealous about loving God and loving others. But now, for whatever reason, your heart has drifted away. Now, again, that doesn't apply to you. So I'm not talking to you right now. I'm talking to everybody who's not here at the moment, okay? But listen, let me give you some of the signs. I was thinking about this this week. If, if you've lost your first love, this is some of the signs that you can, that you can tell. You, number one, you don't have a strong desire to spend time with him. <clears throat> you don't have a strong hunger for the word. For the truth of God, for Bible, re- Bible reading has become a chore rather than something that you delight in. It's become something that you mark off your to-do list. Maybe if you've lost your, lo- your first love, you, your, the spending time in prayer has become an obligation, a burden rather than a delight. Your worship has become a little formal a little dry, a little lifeless, a little going through the motions. And and your, your private prayer life, your private worship life are almost non-existent. They're cold and dry. And you're concerned more about what others think. Hello, we care a lot about what other people think. And you care less about pleasing God. And doing what is right in his eyes. You enjoy secular songs. I'm just getting in your business a little bit right now. Just bear with me, okay? You enjoy secular movies and books and music and all that instead of stuff that lifts up Christ in your life. You're more interested in recreation and entertainment and having fun rather than cultivating intimacy with God. Rather than spending time in worship or prayer or the word or spending time together in Christian fellowship. This doesn't apply to anybody. I didn't think so. Okay. Don't raise your hand. Okay. So you display attitudes or are involved in activities that you know are contrary to scripture, but you don't care and you do them anyway. And you justify small areas of disobedience or compromise. Little things that used to disturb you, used to disturb your conscience, no longer bother you at all. You're slow to respond when the Holy Spirit convicts you of something, or you just ignore it altogether. You're self-righteous. Hello. You're self-righteous. You're more concerned about the sins in other people's lives than you are about the sin in your life. You tend to hold tightly to money and to things and to materialism uh, rather than being quick to give, quick to be generous and meet the needs of others. If you're lukewarm, if, you're, if you've drifted away, if you lost your first love, you rarely give anything at all. And you rarely give anything sacrificially to the work of God. 
accumulating and maintaining material things consumes more of your time and more of your effort than you're seeking after and cultivating your spiritual life with God. And finally, maybe you, you're, 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 you have broken relationships with other believers that you're unwilling and you're not even attempted to reconcile. If you find yourself in any of those things, I know you don't, but if, if people who are not here find themselves in any of those things, then, then maybe we've lost a little bit of our first love. And maybe we need to repent and come back because you used to be fully devoted. You used to be all in, dedicated to God. You used to obey Him wholeheartedly. You used to have joy and just be zealous about the things of God and loving other people. But now, for whatever reason, you drifted away. Have you ever been there? Are you there now? I can tell you for just by personal experience, I've experienced most of that list right there myself. So I'm not going to stand up here and say that I've got it all together because I don't. And as I told you at the beginning, I need times of refreshing. I need times of renewal in revival too. So if you're in that place where you've lost your first love, what do you do? What are you supposed to do to get it Back in the book of Revelation, I'm so glad you asked, by the way. In the book of Revelation, let's look at it together. Revelation chapter 2, Jesus has a, has a sobering and powerful message that he speaks to the church in Ephesus, which is in modern Turkey. But in Revelation chapter 2, you've you got to hear this. It says this, to the church, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write these things. These are the words of him who holds the seven Stars. Now, the seven stars represent the messengers or the angels. In his right hand, uh, that's where they are, and they walk among the seven golden, excuse me, golden lampstands. Now, lampstands represent, you know, the book of Revelation is very symbolic. So when it's talking about stars, he's talking about messengers or angels. He's, when he's talking about lampstands, he's talking about churches. Okay, churches, the lampstands give off light. Lampstands uh, shine in the darkness, right? Lamp, this is what a lampstand is. So Jesus goes on to say this to this church in Ephesus. He says this, I know your deeds, how, how hard you work and your perseverance. How many of you guys know that Jesus knows What's going on in your life? He knows what's going on in this church. He knows what's going on in our city and in our nation. He knows. He, let's keep reading. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are actually not. And have found them false. You have persevered and you have endured hardships for my name. And you have not grown weary. How many of you know that if you're going to tell somebody something that's a challenge, you start it off with a compliment? Okay? This is exactly what Jesus does right here. He is laying it on. He is saying, well done. You have not tolerated wickedness. You have not put up with false doctrine. You have, not done, you have endured and you have kept the good fight. And then he says, yet I hold this. One thing against you. I hold this against you. Look at these words. You have forsaken the love you had at first. In other words, you have lost your first love. And he says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you. How many of you know you don't want Jesus Christ to come to you for not doing something that he told you you need to do, right? Okay, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. So back to the question that we're wrestling with. What do you do if you've lost your first love? What do you do if your heart has drifted away and you've grown cold and, you, and you're starting to go through the motions, but there's no love there, there's no passion there? The number one, number one the scripture tells us is just to remember. Jot that down if you're taking notes with me. Remember. 
Consider how far you have fallen, the scripture says. This is a call to reflect. This is a call to go back to the past. This is a call to recall things from your life. Jesus is saying, remember how it used to be. Remember how it used to be in your relationship with me. Let me, let me ask all of us here and those of us listening on YouTube, do you remember when God first awakened your soul? Do you remember when God saved you? Do you remember when God set you free? Do you remember when he gave you a love for him? Do you remember when you loved to study the word? Do you remember when you were, you were just so anxious and excited to get to your prayer time? Not because you wanted to check something off your Christianity to-do list, but because in your prayer time, you were going to meet and Spend time with your first love. Do you remember that? Do you remember that when God saved you, you used to be a dead sinner, but now you're alive in Christ. You used to be an enemy of God, but now you are beloved. You are a son and a daughter of God. Do you remember that? And do you remember having those times where you would just whisper to the Lord maybe, and, this, uh, and you would say things like, like the, what the psalmist said in Psalm 73. He said, Whom have I in heaven but you? And, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. This is a love for God. Do you remember when you would stay up late just to pour out your heart and to worship Him? Do you remember when you would get up early just to open up your soul to Him and spend time with your love? Do you remember? This is the first thing you need to do if you find yourself drifting away. If you find yourself that you have lost your first love, you've got to remember where he, he brought you from. You've got to remember all the things that he has given to you, that he blessed you with. Number two is this. Jot this down. You not only remember, but repent. <clears throat> Let's just shoot it straight today, right? To repent means to, ch to change the mind or change your purpose, to change your decision. It means to recognize that the previous decision, the previous opinion that you held, the previous condition, you recognize that as wrong. And you accept and you move forward the truth of God. To repent, to turn around, to change your ways completely. Not just feel bad about it. That is part of it. Godly sorrow is involved in that. But it's a change of action. It's a change in the way you think. It's a change in your heart attitudes. This is what it means to repent. It's not just, hey, do better next time. It's not just don't feel guilty and hide behind the bushes of good intentions. It's not just those things. It's go to your Savior in the blood of Jesus and cry out for mercy. It's go to Him openly and honestly, confessing your coldness to Him and asking Him for grace. Asking Him for help. Yes, you tell Him that you've grown cold. You tell Him that you've entertained other loves, that He has some rivals going on in your heart. Yes, you repent to God for not loving Him with everything that you have. You repent to Him for not loving Him for, for uh, who He is and what He deserves. He stands ready. Here's the important thing. He stands ready to forgive. And He stands ready to give you grace and to restore you. Hebrews chapter 4 Look at this. It says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. How many of you are glad that we can approach the throne of God with confidence? And that when he hears us, he is going to extend mercy. He's going to extend grace into our lives. And when we're in trouble, when we're in need, when we have lost our way, we can always go to our good, good father. <clears throat> I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And I'm going to give you this third point. So remember, right? Remember. Number two is repent. Repent. Change your ways, change your way of thinking, change your actions, your attitudes. Number three is just return. 
Do your first works over again, the Bible says. Amazingly, God calls us to return to where we once fell. He calls us to do those things we did at first. He calls us back to that fresh fire of loving Him. It's a call to action. It's a, it's a call back to the habits of grace. It's a call back to prayer. It's a call back to worship. It's a call back to studying the Word. It's a call back to the habits of grace. And it's a call to keep ourselves, keep ourselves in the love of God. How many of you know you have to keep yourself in the love of God? The love of God is great, but you got to keep yourself there. you got to keep yourself under the spout where the glory comes out, as they say, right? you got to keep yourself there in the love of God. Let me show it to you in Scripture. Jude, uh, verses 20 and 21. It says this, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit... Keep yourselves in God's love. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. We've got to keep ourselves in the love of God. So what do we do if we're falling away from God, if we're we're missing our first love, if we're drifting away from Him? We have to remember. We have to repent. And we have to turn, return, and go back to God. Amen? Amen. And for the church in Ephesus, what Jesus said, he said the, the removal of their lampstand or their witness, the removal of their lampstand or their witness is the alternative. You can go ahead and begin to play softly, please. It'll help me wind down. <clears throat> The removal of their lampstand, the removal of their witness is the alternative if they don't obey, if they don't remember, if they don't repent, if they don't return to the Lord. The Lord said he will come personally and he will remove their lampstand. In other words, if you don't do those things, you will lose your light bearing capacity. Let Let me say it this way. This is an easy way to remember this, okay? It's up on the screen. Left love means lost light. <clears throat> left love means lost light. When you lose your first love, your light dimmers. It goes down, it goes out. We want to be a church whose light is bright. We want to be a church where Jesus is not saying, I'm going to come to you. And I'm going to remove your lampstand. No, we want Jesus to be our first love. We need to repent from everything that's been a rival in our hearts. And we need to say, no, I'm going to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, with everything that I have. I don't know about you, but I'm praying for personal revival. I'm praying for revival for our church. I'm praying... That Jesus continues to be my first love now and forevermore. And I'm praying that God strengthens me. That no matter what we go through in this life, nothing will ever change the fact that Jesus is my first love. He's my first love no matter what. No matter what happens. He will always be my first love. And And I've been praying for all of us that we would have that kind of fortitude, that kind of stubbornness, that kind of resolve this year in 2019 that says no matter what comes my way, no matter what struggles, no matter what good things come my way, I'm not going to forget my love for God. He's going to be my priority. Vance Habner, a uh, preacher of old, said this, a revival is the church falling in love with Jesus Christ all over again. Man, this is what I'm praying for. I'm praying for revival. Can we be restored? Can we be refreshed in the presence of God? Can we get our passion back? If we've lost any kind of passion, can we get it back? If we're just running at 75%, can we get it back to 100? 
if we're running at 50%. Let's get it back to 100. And maybe today you find yourself at 0%. And you're just like at your wit's end. You're desperate. And you don't know what to do or how to do it. But let me remind you, God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. And he's calling you today to remember. He's calling you today to repent. He's calling you today to return to him with your whole heart. Amen.